White Sox podcast coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me, the full CHGO White Sox crew. That's our CHGO White Sox beat writer, Vinny Duber. You can follow him at Vinny Duber. Read his latest piece about Garrett Crochet's first MLB start up at allchgo.com. And the man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. Hello. Follow him at Ecknerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. We're being produced today by Sarah. Hi. Hello. And make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button and subscribe button as you're joining us here on YouTube. If you're watching after the fact, hello. Thank you very much for joining us. From the past. It. Hello from the past. It's like Herb's video. It's like getting a message in a bottle. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Is that... Oh, Maybe we'll hear some police tunes thrown out because we're going to talk about the 2024 White Sox win song. Transition. Yeah, there you go. I try to figure it out. Um, Talk about the 2024 White Sox win song. They didn't win yesterday, so we don't, we didn't need a song yesterday because they lost. Really can't play a song when they lose. We'll talk a little bit about Luis Robert Jr. growing as a star. We'll talk more about Garrett Crochet and even Michael Kopech's outing yesterday. And then we'll go to our diehards. We got some Discord questions, so we'll go into them. I think we got five questions wow. uh, from diehards. What a showing. I know, right? <laughs> season started. People are amped. It's, it's kind of gotten real active once yeah. the season started. So yeah, And you, people are also like joining too like there's a lot of people joining i think because of the baseball season even though the white Sox look to be uh, kind of like a bad team there's a lot of people just excited for baseball and the white Sox in particular and you if you are looking to join uh, and become a diehard uh, like alejandro did not the alejandro that we met yesterday a different alejandro wow. two alejandros the alejandros keep ro- rolling in yes they do <laughs> uh phil kent and chris if you want to become a diehard uh like aj as well who's in the chat Head over to allchgo.com, become a diehard to get a shirt of your choice. It all comes in this nice box. You get some stickers, you get a membership card, and you get access to the CHGO Discord. You can pick two from one of our new opening day shirts. We've got the Defend the Southside shirt and also Sunday Fun Day shirt uh, over at allchgo.com and the CHGO Locker, chgolocker.com. I feel like I'm missing something. Mm -mm. No? You sure? Community leader? That was what we wanted. That's what yeah, you're great. you're talking about, the diehards and Alejandro. Thank you so much. Nice job, Sean. The other Alejandro. Yeah. Well, you know what people are going to be really excited for? You know what diehards are really excited for? Wins. Mm. White Sox haven't won. They're 0-1. I don't think we're expecting for a lot of wins. We all gave our predictions. The highest win total was you, Vinny, with 71 and 91. I don't know how you're feeling about that prediction, but we'll get to that later on in the show. (laughs) They only gave up one run yesterday. They only gave up one run yesterday. (laughs) I loved the comment yesterday that uh, Garrett Crochet lost the one-on-one battle between Terry Skubel. Uh, And I'm like, that's not how baseball works. No, it's not. But, I mean, like, a good pitcher's duel, certainly. Oh, yeah. Like, if you like pitching, that was the game, and they were both pitching very well. Garrett Crochet <laughs> made a mistake, and Tariq Skubal did not. Uh, so, there you go. Congratulations, Tariq Skubal. Um, anyways, White Sox didn't win, but last year I had a video when the White Sox did win, and I really didn't even post it that much when they actually did win because it didn't feel like true victories because they were so bad, and we expected them to be somewhat decent, uh, or at least more decent than they showed. But... Kind of know where this team stands. Offense is pretty tough. We know that the pitching is hopefully improving, and same with the defense. Might not be a season full of wins, but what song should we use to celebrate the 2024 White Sox? Well, you know that you knew that my pick was going to go local, right? Because I oh, like the whole go. local tie-in aspect. So I'm going with probably the most recognizable song, at least from the solo career, of Chicago native Curtis Mayfield. Let's go with Move On Up uh, from his debut album, which is not only just very energetic, full of horns, good blasting over a stadium PA, but also Move On Up, right? I mean, that's Mm -hmm. you win games, you're moving up in the standings, arguably, and or just in general, moving things forward. I think it it just gets it just sends the the right message there. That's what I'm going with. I'm gonna go with a song from that same 
era, but a different vibe. Um, at the same time the White Sox were saying disco sucks, there was a song coming out that is pretty much the pivotal song of music going forward. And the song is called Good Times by Chic. It has been sampled one of the some of the most times in the history of music. If you don't know what it is, it's the theory, the lyrics are good times. These are the good times. And so after a win, you hear that bass line by Bernard Edwards and you hear the guitar by Nile Rodgers. You can't do anything but to dance and to sing along with the song. It's much better than um, what is the song they sing now? Uh, it's Sweet Home Chicago. Of, oh, yeah. No, I, I well, that's the second one. That, I, that's the second play after the win. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that. There's some sort of... It's the Blues Brothers, right? Well, that's what they play kind of when people are moving out, moving out of the stadium. The one they play right away is some sort of Fallout Boy-esque Ugh. nonsense. Yeah, and so you can just have a song <laughs> that know. is represents that era that they were. And as Kevin says, Sheik is just a phenomenal band. And we still have Nod Rogers with us. Bernard Edwards has passed since then. But that song just, to me, makes me happy. And after a win... Who doesn't want to be happy? I agree with you, and I, I think that's where I try to go. I, I almost picked uh, Le Freak by Chic, so I almost also, picked the same damn band. Yeah, another great song. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to pick something extremely mainstream, but I, I, you'll know these songs, okay? I also... The whole list of oh, candidates. I, I'm very, very, very... Uh, What's it called? Uh, I can't make a choice. I can't make up my damn mind. Panic at the disco, it, Fall Out Boy, whatever. It's same, all that awful. Is, I didn't want to be <laughs> literally the same thing. I do not know the difference between the two people. I, I didn't want to be too on the nose with like you know anything with Win or Victorious, right? So the first one you talk about songs that make you want to dance. Uh, Back that ass up by Juvenile. That song is real great. I mean, every who doesn't love to dance to that song? Because Cash Money is, is uh, taking over for the nine nine and two thousands. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think people feel this way about the 2024 White Sox. If you are showing up to Guaranteed Right Field to watch the 2024 White Sox, you are hopelessly devoted. Uh, so why not go to Greece, a little Olivia Newton-John, get people bumped up and play hopelessly devoted to you? Oof. No? Okay. I don't know. You guys are song. coming at me with disco and show tunes. This is a, this is a poor segment, in how my about, opinion. How about <laughs> here's, here's some rock for you. Baker Street from Jerry Rafferty, because that song just rules. No? Come on. Okay. But right. also, <laughs> maybe, I think, maybe I could have been a, a little bit before we more, keep on going. Uh, specific. I know it's classified as disco, but that song is universal. The guitar, the the saxophone, what the Baker? You're talking about? Baker no, Street. I'm not Baker oh. Street. I'm talking about my song. It's oh. it is a disco song, but it's not of disco. I still had more. Oh, you had more. I didn't know you were still talking about your song. Okay. I, mean, you could have, I could have gave you all the space you wanted. You got uh, more I'm, thoughts on Chic? No, I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead. No, you're good. Uh, wake me up when September ends. Because I, because no, because the season ends. Just in the most, just I mean, literally That's, one of my favorite bands, and you picked like the one song by them I don't like. But it's because the season ends in September. You know, that so is it's true. Like people yes. don't want to even watch the yes. team. Um, how bizarre from OMC because how bizarre the White Sox won a game. <laughs> do 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 do. No, okay. Um, and then this one is very specific. If Davy Garcia records a save, come on, ride it. Parentheses, The Train by Quad City DJs. Because it's a Davy Train. Didn't write it. Didn't write it. Do, do. Now, you want to talk about bad uh, genres of music. That genre of music is terrible. What? Whatever that is. <laughs> space, space Jam genre? Yeah, the the, <laughs> the whoomp, there it is. The ride it type of garbage. The CNC music factory. That type of music is terrible. Um, you, you are getting a fair amount of hate from both AJ and Baloney in the chat. Uh, as a 2000s Chicago "Quote unquote scene kid," I take offense with Vinny's comments and Herb's "ug" when mentioning Fallout Boy. You guys don't like that first album? You know how you the know how one? you know how they say about <laughs> this is a weird trans a weird comment, but you know how they say when like they interview like serial killers and stuff, and they're like right. their their personality is like someone who's not a, like an alien pretending to be human kind of situation. <laughs> I feel like Fallout Boy is like an alien trying to produce rock and roll, but having no idea what they're actually doing. <laughs> they have found their niche of just doing stadium hits, so it's a good call to get them. I was just commenting that if you play a Fallout Boy song or a Panic at the Disco song, I cannot tell the difference because the lead singers and the style of music sound similar. So if you play a song, I'm like, I don't know who that is. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I don't know how 
deep you've delved into the to, to scene music, but I, I think it, that's that more just of because of the, the same sound. Uh, yeah, I, I, Fall Out Boy has really found a good niche since like 2014. They've just really done a great job of creating songs that could be used for NHL games. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. It's not my type of music, but I think the stuff from 2005 ain't bad. You know, that, that I was I was young. It was, what from 2005 was bad. That was a great year. So you Jared, know, was very happy. Jared threw some Seeger in there. That's that. I can get behind that. Oh, okay. I can right. get behind that. Uh, uh, rambling gambling suggestion by uh, yeah. Bob Seeger. Absolutely. Make sure you use the live one off a of live bullet. I don't. That, did live versions hit with wins? I mean, they're good. In my opinion, I would enjoy listening to it. All right. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Louis Robert Jr. would enjoy listening to mm. Bob Seeger. I think that would be a fun nice. conversation that you can now have with him i mean he we have a hard enough time getting Luis robert jr to just not eat domino's pizza <laughs> i think if i went up to him and started talking to him about bob seeger he would look at me as if i you know had just walked in from antarctica but hey now we know that he uh, would understand you he would at least know that he can recognize the words bob seeker uh we saw yesterday before opening day that chuck garfine chatted with Luis robert although briefly i think it was two quick questions but it was Luis robert's first full english interview and what i've heard from just now you know since that has happened from what you guys are saying, it seems like Luis is getting real comfortable with just when you guys ask him questions, he doesn't really need to lean on Billy to translate those questions into English. And he seems a little bit more understanding of the language, which is huge for the superstar. Yeah. I mean, the listen, uh, the, the White Sox have this as, as, as part of their organization, you know, uh, in specific employees who their job is to teach these young prospects that they bring in from, from, whether it's Latin American countries or, or anywhere else in the world where they do not speak English and teach them the language. I mean, it's a very much um, part of your life, not just your work. You know what I mean? And so um, if you're only going to work, you know, from nine to five, let's say every single day, there's those other hours that, that you've got to be living. And it, it, the White Sox are taking the responsibility of, of bringing these people to the United States to work and live. They are also taking the responsibility of trying to uh, make their lives easier by helping them learn this, uh, her, learn the English language. Um, and we've seen over the years, certainly over my years of covering this team, whether it be Jose Abreu, who was here for a very long time, Yoan Moncada, Luis Robert Jr. Now uh, among them, from year to year, less translating has to be done by Billy Russo, who does uh, uh, the interpreting for the White Sox. When we ask questions, because these guys do understand it because they live in this country they know you know what they're doing um they know what we're saying more and more as time goes along um and i think you see the same thing with all three of those guys because uh luis was actually asked yesterday hey we we see that you're understanding what we're saying are, are you planning on answering some questions in english too and i think his and the answer that he gave was i think i have it the language, but I'm I'm fearful of doing it in front of the cameras, and and I think you know when you have everything that you say captured, your meaning is not necessarily coming through right all a hundred percent clearly. So when it's a conversation with someone like myself who's not you know holding the TV live running TV camera there, um, maybe it could be oh I know he was trying to mean this kind of thing. Whereas if you're just presenting the video, that's what you're getting kind of thing, and I think that's what Jose Abreu. Um, you know, Jose Abreu never did an interview in English his whole, and he was here for basically a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, it, I, I don't blame him. If you're not comfortable with getting what you mean across by speaking the language, even if you know it, you know what I mean? Like when the, when the, uh, I, I remember when he came back with the Astros last summer, he, he walked up to me and said, hello, how are you doing, my friend? Like in yes. English, right? I mean, like it's not it's not that they don't know or they're unwilling to know. It's that they have a, hesi a hesitancy based on their meaning and uh, or getting their point across kind of thing, not wanting to be misinterpreted. And I totally understand that. I mean, I couldn't show up, you know, to go work in, in Mexico tomorrow and start speaking Spanish, even if I know some words, you know, like I would be very uncomfortable that my meaning would not get across correctly. So, um it's very cool that Luis did that on TV with Chuck. I would not be surprised if maybe sometime on the road when there aren't cameras running, 
there is an, an interview done in English with him or something like that, uh, or even just a little bit more interaction, even if it's off, off the record kind of thing. So, you know, nothing but applause to those guys who, um, you know, uh, come over here from an entirely different country, an entirely different culture, and speak, the, uh, speak an entirely different language and manage to, over the time here, get more comfortable and, and, and show a willingness uh, to, to, to interact. And with him speaking English, I wanted to let it be known that I don't need Luis Robert Jr. or Yoan Mancada or any Spanish speaker or any foreign speaking language person on the White Sox to speak English. Their job is not to communicate with us. Their job is to play baseball. So when they do do it, it is a extra effort for me that is impressive because, as Vinny just said, they're coming from a foreign country with different customs, different languages, and to uh, learn English from Spanish, which Spanish is a romance language, so it's a little easier to learn like another romance language like uh, Fran French or Portuguese. But you're going to English, which is a total different thing. It's Germanic. It's hard. You're in. You're you're ingratiating yourself into a different culture and speaking with these people that are looking at you weird when you do say something. So you, as the speaker, are now like, did I say that correctly? Am I conveying my message correctly in their language? And so it takes bravery for a person, firstly, to commit to learning English because for all those people out there in the United States, there is no official language of the United States of America. You can speak whatever you want to, but I know people out there like, oh, you got to speak English for me to go to you. I know people hold that against Yoan Mancata specifically because he doesn't speak English, doesn't communicate to the fans. So for Luis Robert Jr. to do this, it takes a lot of bravery. It takes a lot of skill, and I think it's unnecessary, but I love that he's doing it for himself to further his languages and to further his comfortability with the United States audience that he is serving. Linguistics expert Herb Lawrence. Not really. Look I just at you. I no. looked at, oh, come on. I just looked the romantic up. languages, hey, the Germanic languages. Nothing he said was wrong. No, yeah. I know. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I called him an expert. Yeah, I just looked it up. That's all it is. Like it's God. tough. Like I as Vinny said, I know some Spanish. Vinny probably knows a lot more because he took a lot more classes in Spanish. But I couldn't go to anywhere that speak Spanish and say, have a full conversation and understanding. I could pick out words. Oh, yeah, you said uh, Tambien also. I got you. But other than that, no, I wouldn't speak Spanish at all in another language. And if I, even if I was living there for five straight years, to talk on a microphone in that language with other people, like, critiquing your language? No, absolutely not. I went to Mexico at the end of last year, and, man, did I butcher the hell out of that language. Uh, yo hablo espanol. You said hablo you know oh it's just God. Ablo, right? Ablo. <laughs> well, again, I butchered the language. Yeah. I, the H's are silent. I think it's brave of Luis Robert Jr. And hey, I, I'm not expecting him to come out and you know give a, a five-minute monologue or speech or anything. It's cool that he can interact. And at best, he can now at least interact with young children when he's signing autographs. And it's just you know a brief like hello, and he can go back and forth and just exchange stuff. I think I could say, you know, hola, hola. Uh, Como estas? And, you know, just have a, a brief interaction. But I think that would mean the world to you know, even a child who's looking for that, that autograph and that interaction with their favorite player. So I think it's very cool of Luis Robert Jr. to show this side of him and be bold enough and brave enough to try it out because you guys are absolutely right. Uh, I would not want me speaking Spanish uh, on tape, even though I, I guess I just threw it out there with my hablo. Uh. You didn't really speak it. Oh, well, that's, that's fair. All right, uh, let's take a break, and uh, we'll let you know about some of our sponsors, and then we will talk more about Garrett Crochet and Michael Kopech's outing yesterday. We want to let you know about our friends over at Ray Chevy. They have their best offers of the year during the March Radness, Radness. event. So rad. So rad. It's so rad when Illinois wins, huh, Herb? Oh. ILL. I and I. There you go. Make your way to Ray Chevrolet on Route 12 in Fox Lake to join in on the savings. As one of the top-selling Chevy dealers in the Midwest, you'll always be able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest Chevy inventories, and they have perfect tailgating vehicles that await you at Ray Chevy during Truck Month. Truck month. For a limited time, they're offering 0% financing for 72 months on new Silverados with over 100 available, and they have 125 vehicles under $20,000. Seriously, can pricing get more affordable? I don't think it can. I guess it can because they're offering you a free oil change. Uh, right now, 
at Ray Chevy in Fox Lake. You can get a free oil change, and all you need to do is mention CHGO when scheduling your oil change. Start off the new year right and schedule it by April 1st. Visit Ray Chevrolet in Fox Lake or RayChevrolet.com. They've been serving the community since 1963. Find new roads. Eating better is easier with Factors Delicious and ready to go Ready to eat meals. Every fresh, never frozen meal is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to go in just two minutes. You have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Also, there are more than 60 add ons to help you stay fueled and feeling good all day long. What are you waiting for? Get started today and get after your goals. You can discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like pancakes, smoothies, and more. Factor meals are also ready to heat and eat. So there's no prepping, no cooking, no cleanup needed. Also with Factor meals, you can get as much or as little as you want by choosing your meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. Factor is also the perfect solution if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head on order to factormeals.com slash chgosocks50 and use the code chgosocks50 for 50% off your first Factor box. chgosocks50 at factormeals.com slash chgosocks50 and get 50% off. Thank you, Herb. Uh, we didn't get to this part in the Robert discussion. I guess we can throw it out because I know Vinny had some thoughts. Uh, Kevin Kaduk yesterday asked me at Ballpark Pub, who are the superstars in Major League Baseball? I gave him 13. Uh, I know one of them, uh, Vinny, would contend, and he also wants to add some on. I don't know about Herb, but I have Aaron Judge, Ron Lacuna Jr., Mookie Betts, Corey Seager, Freddie Freeman, Juan Soto, Jordan Alvarez, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, Bryce Harper, J-Rod, Fernando Tatis Jr., and Vlad Guerrero Jr. In no certain order, obviously, if we were going to rank them. Probably Shohei won, <laughs> but that doesn't mean much. Uh, what did I get wrong? Who would you add? Who would you subtract? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the definition of the word, and it's one of those that is totally up to whoever is is thinking about it on a given day, right? I mean, I think even I, in looking at your list and thinking of my own, were, was like, oh, well, you could go a ton of different ways with this. I think you can talk about, hey, who's a superstar in terms of a global, you know, that any person that you stopped on the street would hear of, there was that conversation for so long Would the random person even recognize who Mike Trout, a picture of Mike Trout, who he even is. Um, and I think that Major League Baseball finally has that person in Shohei Otani, now maybe for better or worse, with what he's going with, with what the, is surrounding him at the moment. But certainly that is someone who anybody in the world, if they're a sports fan, knows who that is. But then there's also... Two baseball fans, right? Who is a superstar? Two baseball fans. And I think that list gets a lot longer, probably longer than the one that you have there because, hey, uh, you know, if you're even just a fan of your team, you know when Cleveland comes to town that, oh my God, this Jose Ramirez guy, you know, he is pretty darn good. Is he one of the most marketable players in the world? No, probably not. But you're going to know that caliber of player, that class of player. I think what uh, you what your list maybe forgets a little bit is the idea that you, there are some players that are so great that they achieve superstar status and never let it go, even if they currently aren't one of the best. Justin Verlander is a superstar. That's fair. Jose Altuve is a superstar. Uh, and those guys are never not going to be superstars. But as we've seen with other guys... There are guys who can reach that pinnacle and then fall so quickly. Christian Yelich comes to mind, and and even Tim Anderson comes to mind, right? A guy who had perhaps only for a couple of years, but as big of a profile as anybody, but now after a few bad years, he's playing for a team that uh, doesn't get much attention, A, with the White Sox, and B, with the Marlins. You know, is he going to be this guy anymore? No, probably not, but... Uh, I think the one guy maybe that you left off your list that I would really gripe about, maybe Manny Machado, you know, really one of the better players in the league. And I would only probably say that because you included Fernando Tatis Jr., his teammate. And I think you can point to Manny Machado as being a little bit more of an established household name, even than a guy who's been on video game covers and, and, and been, uh, you know, that, that at that peak kind of visibility. So I think there's a lot of ways you can go with it. Uh, and I think it really depends, but it's a fun discussion to have. My definition of superstar is i don't know if you guys recall the geico commercials back in the day where the caveman was saying to all pro linebacker brian arakpo hi all pro linebacker brian arakpo 
Superstars don't need that. That Geico commercial could have been with Shohei Itani. He would have just had a conversation with Shohei Itani, and everybody would have been like, that's Shohei Itani. I don't need you to announce that guy. A superstar is doesn't need anybody else. It doesn't need the, the lower third to say his name. That's a superstar. Like, yeah, maybe middle America or the rest of America doesn't know Mike Trout walking down the street, but he saw Mike Trout in the commercial. Like, it's Mike Trout. That's my definition of a superstar. So some of those players that you have on that list, I think – a fall into that category, but there's some players I agree with any that Manny Machado. You see him, it's Manny Machado. Everybody knows the ears, the look, the the skills, ears. everything. Yeah, he's, that's a that's a trademark and look. And so that's where I would say a superstar is. Now, is Luis Robert there yet? Not sure. To no. me, in Chicago, I think he's a superstar. But superstar, I think, uh, is also global or even even just right here in the United States, not just where you live. Real quick. After both of your answers, I have no idea whether I should lengthen this list or shorten it. Yeah, right? So. And that's what I'm saying. Is that it just, it, 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 it's, it's more for discussion purposes. I would say that under the definition, if you're going to call it that, under the idea, let's say, that baseball fans consider you one of the most important people to be paying attention to in baseball, I think Luis Robert Jr. falls into that category. But I think if you're looking for people who transcend the game, you know what I mean? You, you know, if you got a football fan watching Sports Center, it'd be like, oh, here's a White Sox highlight. I'm going to see some Luis Robert Jr. action right now. He's probably not there because baseball doesn't have a lot of those guys in general. Nope. 780 players are usually on a, a, a like active Major League Baseball players, 26 times 30. Very easy math. How much of a percent are superstars, I guess? Yeah. I would like, say that's the. I, I mean, one. I made a quick I made a quick list and came up with, and I think it went to twenty eight. Mm -hmm. But I could, you could easily argue me to include some and leave out some others. But like, maybe it is about the number of teams, not necessarily one per team, but maybe it's about the number of teams. And so, yeah, maybe it's close like to one percent or something. Three whatever and a, that would yeah, be. If yeah. It's, if it's twenty eight, that's three and a half. Yeah. So maybe it's you know. And Alejandro two, three, brings up a good point. Luis Robert still has to wear his own jersey <laughs> in his music videos and music videos, which he did this off season. It's like, yeah, that's kind of weird. It's like if you are that guy, just be in that video, like Yo Mancada when it's singing his own video, he's just got a shirt on. He doesn't have his cap, and hey, I'm Yoan Mancata. Then I would just say that, that there's three superstars then in Major League Baseball. Judge, Otani, and Harper. I if, think you go by my, if you go by my thing? Yeah, the, like what, what, what can the, the regular sports fan identify on the street? I, I mean, you, you brought up Corey Seager. I, Corey Seager is a two-time World Series MVP, but I don't know if you can recognize Corey Seager on the street. Well, and that's and that's not Corey Seager's problem. That's baseball's no. problem. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, and he makes enough money. He does enough, as you like said, on the field. He's got a brother that played Major League Baseball. Like, he's a high-profile guy. I probably would have a hard time, besides the, what, 6'3 uh, frame, to say if Corey Seager walked on the street next to me, I'm like, that's just a regular ass dude. Yeah. Well, you uh, contended with Jordan, and I I get it in a way because in 2019, he only played 87 games, only played two in 2020. Uh, I guess he's only played one this year, but I won't count him like, that against him. Uh, but 114 in 2023, like he's been to the the World Series a ton. He's got a 165 OPS plus. I think any baseball fan can tell you, oh, that's Jordan Alvarez. But also, too, maybe he hasn't played enough games uh, and. The Tatis one, too, I think, since he hasn't won a major award. Uh, so, yeah, and shout out Christmas Story. Um, even though he's been on the cover of Major League Base, uh, MLB The Show, uh, I don't know, maybe he's just not there yet. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much of the cachet uh, we have to include, because even uh, Verlander, I think, would include there. Uh, Baloney saying 10 to 12 bona fide superstars, 28 stars. Does each team have a star, except Oakland? No. But I think there are there are teams that there are teams that have three, yeah, you know, the and there are teams yeah. that have zero, you know. So I think it kind of balances out in the end. Right? Well, the Dodgers have Will Smith on their team. <laughs> well, I think he'd be pretty visible. Superstar. You wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't need me to tell you who Will Smith was, well, right? Tell me, <laughs> tell me the superstar on the team that scored fourteen runs in the third inning last night. Uh, you could just say the Diamondbacks. I don't know if anyone. I'd put I'd call Corbin Carroll a superstar right now. Mm, we'll see he? what happens two uh, two three years from they're now. They're all but great. Yeah. I'd put him in the star. Yeah. I think he's where Luis is right now. But he's, like, diminutive. You see him on the streets. You see him in a commercial. Like, who is that? Is that Dansby Swanson? Is that... Whose cousin is that? Yeah, exactly. Like, he's... Yeah, he is of a, a stature, and he's great as baseball fans. But, like, you put him in a commercial, I would know if that was him. Mm -hmm. uh, Want to take a break, and then we'll get into some... Uh, 
uh, Garrett Crochet and Michael Kopech stuff. I didn't get this at the top and want to make sure that we do also welcome you into the CHGO White Sox show presented by Fa- Factor Meals. You'd co- use code CHGOSOX50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life with any active subscription at factormeals.com slash CHGOSOX50. Also want to let you know about our friends over at Circus Sportsbook. If you are looking to bet or wager on the games this weekend, uh, whether the White Sox on Saturday or Sunday as they play on the Detroit Tigers, check out our friends over at Circus Sportsbooks. Game will Games will strive to be a minus 110 split on the circuit menu, unlike other sports books, which may use a minus 115 or minus 120 split. What that means to you is if you wager on something at minus 110 compared to minus 115, you will win less money at minus 115. They are trying to make the lines appealing to you, the sports better, and they also want to be appealing by not limiting you. They're not going to limit you based on their winnings. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players, and they want to make sure that you are getting the best line possible. They're the world's largest sports book, and they are trying to offer the sharpest lines possible, and they encourage you to download other sports books and see the other lines, compare the lines, and you'll see most of, if not all the time, that Circus Sportsbook has the best line for you to wager on, and there are real people behind the Circus Sports brand who resolve issues in a timely fashion, and you won't have to talk to any chat bots. They'll take care of you right away. So download the Circus Sports Illinois app at circusports.com slash Illinois dash app. That's circusports.com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Also be on the lookout for Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates coming up like the Bears draft party coming up in April. I believe Gary Fensick will be there. Yes. Uh, I was going to say Doug Plank, but I think it's Gary Fensick. Uh, my bad on that. Uh, <laughs> if you or somebody you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER, 1-800-426-2537, text GMB833-233. Text GMB to 833-234 or visit areyoureallywinning.com. Also want to let you know about our friends over at CD1 Price Cleaners. Maybe you're like Herb and spilled mustard all over your jersey at the White Sox game. Oh, no. Uh, What are you going to do? You're going to use our friends over at CD1 Price Cleaners because they have low prices. Customers save over 30% on their dry cleaning bill by switching over to CD1 Price Cleaners and their professional cleaners. So whether it be a normal shirt, Maybe you got some pants you need clean. Maybe you need that mustard stained uh, cleaned off your jersey. First off, all those garments are going to be the same low price. And they're going to take care of all those difficult garments like your sports jerseys for the same low price. Other cleaners charge a different price for every garment. CD1 Price Cleaners does not. And they have a fast turnaround. They have your order ready the same or next day. Other cleaners take two to four days to have your clean garments ready. That's not the case with CD1 Price Cleaners. And once it's ready within that day... They'll send you a text when your order is ready for pickup. And they have a wide variety of services like dry cleaning. They'll wash and fold your laundry. They'll wash those pesky blankets and comforters. They offer tailoring and alterations. And they also offer cleaning of your leather that you have and your area rug. I don't know how to really phrase it. Maybe a leather jacket. I know cleaning Jared. of your leather, yeah. like you have like hides up in your in your house. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Don't clean it. Don't clean <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, visit chgo.cdone.com. The link is in the description. And once you're there, you can pick from an in-store coupon or online pickup and delivery coupon options. Thank you to our friends over at CD1 Price Cleaners, chgo.cdone.com. All right, let's get to some Garrett Crochet and Michael Kopech talk. First off, I've brought up Stuff Plus before. Yep. Uh, obviously, that's a Eno Saris thing. He started that, uh, the father of Stuff Plus, over at The Athletic. And basically, it's just trying to grade a pitcher's arsenal, right? So 100 is average for a major league pitcher. Anything over 100 is good. Anything under 100 is bad. So if we could see the daily leaderboard from yesterday, let's see who topped the daily leaderboard because these are all aces. These are all the best pitchers unless someone's hurt like Garrett Cole or maybe uh, you know Jordan Montgomery's not on the Diamondbacks yet. Most of their teams throw out their best pitchers. Uh, Sarah, it's not this one. I'm sorry. It's it's the one with uh, all of the, them on. The, thank you very much. Let's look at this list. Oh, my. Um, this is from at TJ Stats on Twitter, Thomas uh, Nestesco, and it's a nice way to visualize all this stuff. Who's number one on that list, guys? Garrett Crochet. What? <laughs> Who? The reliever? <laughs> the opener. How about the that? Opener? <laughs> How about that Pirates guy? Good for him. Yeah. Hey, Mitch Keller. He got <laughs> extended. But uh, if we're if you're looking at this on the right, is where that stuff plus stat is, and everything in between the logo uh, and that stuff plus number is the actual grading of those pitches. So if we're looking at Garrett Crochet's four pitches, uh, uh, his. Uh, 
Changeup had a 108 grade, his cutter had a 104 grade, his four seam fastball had a 107 grade, and his slider had a 114 grade for a stuff plus of 110. That ties Tyler Glass now. That's better than Tariq Skubal. That's better than Mitch Keller. That's better than you, Darvish. That's better than Corbin Burns. That's better than Cole Raggins. That's better than Reagans. That's better than Fre- uh, Framber Valdez. That's better than Logan Webb. And that's better than Nestor Cortez. And it's the, better than everyone. It's better than everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to go through all those names because those are all aces and there are what 29 other names that he's above a crazy outing from Garrett Crochet and just seeing that stuff plus at 110 he being able to do that for 87 pitches his first career high or his career high before this was 46 so nearly doubling his career high in pitches and he was able to keep his stuff not only next level but elite for the entire outing I just hope and pray Every single night that Garrett Crochet's shoulder and arm feels great. I just, I really, really hope that this turns into something special for not only the White Sox, but Garrett Crochet because he looked phenomenal yesterday. Yeah, I am a fan of him wanting to do this in the first place, wanting to be a starter, and then talking his talk. You know, he's like, I don't care about pitch counts or innings limits and I think you uh, alluded to a little bit Sean about you know the White Sox have to watch him because this is a new thing where they haven't done this and he hasn't done this in his career but for a debut I don't know if there has been a starter that has that filthy of a stuff and then the confidence that's behind it I mean I'm just shocked that he talked it into existence and then went out there and executed it. And I saw some of the interview after Vinny didn't seem like he was a hundred percent like over the moon about his actual outing, which is blowing my mind. He thinks there's more out there there that he has better out there, even though he gave up a soft single to Javi Baez and that run scored eventually with just moving him over. So I'm just, floored by the guy having the confidence that he has and then going out and execute his plan to perfection almost. I mean, listen, it's uh, it's it's a hell of a first start, right? I mean, and obviously literally a first start, but I mean a first start in terms of the entire year because that really is, at the end of the day, what's going to be important when we can sit here six months from now and say, Garrett Crochet did X, right? And and he was either successful or unsuccessful because of what we saw over a very long period of time. But if he's going to go ahead and start it like this and show that he can handle major league lineups like that, mm-hmm. I mean, and and guys, you know, I, I, I hate to be that guy, but like, you know what the biggest and most impressive thing of the day was yesterday for him? No walks. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. for a team that had a very good pitcher who struggled with that in Dylan Cease and a pitcher who has continued to struggle by because of his struggles with that in Michael Kopech, that is something that White Sox fans got to look at and go, wow, because to not just dominate that lineup, strike out a bunch of guys, allow so little in, in, in the columns where it matters on the scoreboard, but then to say, I'm not even going to give you any – any little extra steps to try and and get another run here by walking you that is really impressive and listen Sean we talked about the the differences in efficiency right Pedro Grafol said it yesterday that's why he pitched on opening day mm-hmm. because he pitched like that he didn't he just didn't throw a lot of balls and uh, and and to not really come close to walking anybody uh, that is the biggest thing and the thing that shows you that maybe there is some sustainability here yeah, the one guy that you know I've tried to defend as much as possible is Michael Kopech and last year he had one start where he didn't walk anybody uh, and pitch more than six innings that was May 19th against the Royals eight innings one hit no walks, 10 strikeouts. Pretty good. Um, I don't know. Uh, obviously, he couldn't repeat that a ton, but Crochet was able to repeat that. And uh, Sarah, that first one that you flashed uh, of Garrett Crochet, we can go back to that. Uh, the big thing with his fastball, obviously, it's huge. He's getting a ton of extension, about seven feet of extension for Crochet. But the biggest thing is, and I don't even know if you could see it, but there's the zone percent uh, next to TJ Stuff Plus, 68.4% of the time his fastball was in the zone. So nearly 70% of the time he was locating that fastball. And that's when that crazy slider comes. You don't have time to react and think, is this a ball or not? And then by that time, it's already curving 15 feet inside of you and at your feet. Like it's just a disgusting, disgusting arsenal. And if he is healthy, 
There's not an arsenal like this. There's no other six foot six or six foot six inches, two hundred and forty pound, bald headed, muscled out freaks like Carrot Crochet. Like he is extremely unique. His stuff is extremely uh, unique to him himself, and it's really set apart by that composure and control that he showed. And I just want to watch this every single five days. Like uh, that that's all I want to be greedy. I want to be selfish, I guess in a way and just watch Garrett Crochet throw every five days. And even though, you know, the Tigers, I don't know where they're going to land hitting wise. There's some formidable bats in there. Like we talked about Mark Hanna can hit same thing with Spencer Torkelson. He'll step up in competition versus the Braves. I'm looking so forward to that. Just, you know, kind of when we're talking Illinois and Iowa State last night, it was the the juxtaposition of great offense versus great defense. That will be that next start for Garrett Crochet, the great defense that he provides. When you're talking about 68% of his fastballs in the zone, it tells me that he's not scared. He's like, here it is, guys. See what you can do. Do your worst. And one of those, you know, Javi got a single. He just stroked that off and it's like, okay, no one else will get hits. Now what? So I'm looking forward to his next start, even if he gets touched up a little bit. Everybody knows the Braves are the Braves and they have hitters, but I don't think he's going to get absolutely destroyed and I don't think he's going to shrink and not allow them to hit his balls. They're like, here it is. If you can hit it, I'll tip the cap. But otherwise, you go sit your ass on the bench. And that is a thing that the White Sox haven't had as a starting pitcher. Like, actually, every day, I don't think since Lu- Lucas Giolito was doing his thing at the height of his White Sox starting. I mean, Dylan Cease was pretty good. Dylan Cease years he back. was good, but I don't think <laughs> Rodon he... Rodon was decent in I don't think he was good, but I don't think he had the presence. Like, the presence that he had last night. Like, or yesterday. I get what you're saying. Like, the presence yeah. is just different from him. And Lucas is the same way. Like, he would throw high changeups, and in baseball... High changeups get rocked. Lucas said, "Go ahead and try," and he would. Nobody would do it because the tunneling was so good. And like you said, Sean, like you have no chance to adjust that slider because oh, this fastball is located. He knows what he's doing. So I think the presence is just uh, impressing me because he has never done this before. The one guy that has always struggled with presence and composure on the mound is Michael Kopech. I got more crazy-ass stats to throw at you. And again, a shout-out to at TJ Stats on Twitter for these graphics and his work uh, with, uh, you know, putting all this number these numbers together. Uh, same old story with Michael Kopech. The TJ stuff plus on his fastball is 120, okay? I want to put this into context. Mm-hmm. That's TJ, higher than anything that we saw on that chart from yesterday. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and he was TJ Stats was asked, uh, a stuff plus... Uh, of 120 for a fastball in your model is pretty ridiculous, right? Very much so is the response. That's the thing with Michael Kopech is he has one of the most unique fastballs in all of baseball. The issue is just like Ricky Vaughn, Nuke Lelouch and Kenny Powers is he can't locate it. Are you telling me that Michael Kopech is fictional? I, I think he <laughs> might be. And truly like, Unlike those guys, he doesn't have this exuberant personality, but man, he's got a disgusting fastball. And it's the same old Michael Kopech that we saw, uh, you know, throughout 2023. Six plate appearances, one hit, one walk, one hit by pitch, and a strikeout to end the inning. That was just demonic stuff. I mean, you talked about it. It was a fastball high, or no, it was a fastball low, it was a fastball high, I and mean, then it was a slider low, and it was the best slider, I think you oh. said, that you've seen from Kopech. And it... I don't know if he needed the reset from Ethan Katz and needed the the talk to. It helped. To. It helped. Yeah. But it just it's it's never there for Kopech. And that's the issue that I just have is I understand moving him to the bullpen and not being a starter so you don't drain your bullpen, but Kopech's issues of throwing strikes is still present. I and mean he got out by the skin of his teeth yesterday. I mean, here's the thing. Listen, Pedro Grifol was talking positively at the end because of what the result was, right? He didn't end up giving up any runs, and the strikeout to end it was very good. It got it. It, it was it was a big moment in a very close game. But here's the thing. You, you, you can't be putting yourself in that moment. Thank you. I mean, it'd be one thing if, if Michael came into the game after somebody else had loaded the bases and, and struck out that guy in that fashion. That would have been gigantic, right? But he loaded the bases. He hit a guy on an 0-2 pitch. And then he gave up a, a, a hit. Uh, uh, the single came in another count where he was ahead 0-2. And then he walks a guy with two outs. I mean, this is what Chris Getz was talking about. The, uh, in the, the problems with getting out of innings, the fact that that pitch count is going up, up, up because he can't finish things the way that he, that he should, that he's expected to be. Um, that's why Michael Kopech is not starting. 
And I think our question that we all have remains unanswered after seeing him throw in what admittedly is just one regular season game is why won't those same issues be a problem in a, in a relief role? And we saw yesterday that that game could have gone from tie it with one swing when Luis Robert Jr. comes up or whoever comes up uh, in the bottom of that inning it was teetering on the edge of this game's about to be over because Michael Kopech might give up three runs here. And again, the result ended up being a good one. But if you, if the if we're gonna if we're gonna heap so much praise on Garrett Crochet for uh, the first impression that he gave yesterday, then the first impression that Michael Kopech gave yesterday, and granted, it's not a first impression because we watched it all year long last year, but it, it it doesn't show me anything different from what we saw last year. Give the guy another six months to change that narrative, sure. Yeah. But uh, but it, that that was the exact same guy that we saw last year, and it did nothing to convince, I'm sure, any of us that the problems he had as a starter won't be detri- detrimental as a reliever. And Michael Kopech is the enigma. He like has the filthy stuff, but we're, I know the White Sox have tried probably everything, sports psychologist, bringing in new people to talk to him. Hey, switch to the different side of the mic or to the different side of the uh, rubber. Do this, that, and the other. And they've exhausted themselves with Michael Kopech to get that mindset unlocked because you see so much potential in there. After a while, if you keep on doing what he did yesterday, they won't strike out. You'll walk them. They'll give up home. You'll give up home runs. But I hope to today's or yesterday's performance gives him confidence that says, I can get these people out when I need to get them out without putting the three guys on the bases before that. But that's what, and, but listen, we talked about it. That's what Dylan Cease did and does successfully, right? Yes. Dylan Cease keeps walking people, but but Dylan Cease doesn't let it, he doesn't let it get any, he doesn't let it get bad on the scoreboard, which is what Michael Kopech did last year. So you could say that yesterday, Michael Kopech did kind of what Dylan Cease does, right? Which is, yeah, he put guys on base, but he didn't let any of them come home. To me, though, it was he didn't finish off at bats. He didn't finish off the inning when he could have. He could have made that a lot easier on himself, and he made it much harder on himself. And it seems very difficult for him to truly build off of it because they just brought up that May 19th start, and he had five straight starts where it was Eight innings, one hit, no walk, 10 Ks. Seven innings, two hits, one walk, nine Ks. Four and a half innings where he got roughed up a little bit. Five hits, two walks, 10 Ks. Seven innings, three hits, one walk, nine Ks. Five innings, five hits, one walk, six Ks. That's, what, five straight where he had no more than two walks in an outing? Like, and then it just all crumbles. And that, on June 16th, it's all him crumbling. Like, I, I don't know what it is. And I honestly think that it could just be... He's just not that good of an athlete. Like, I, I don't think that when you look at pitchers that have control issues, sometimes when they're a starter, it's like, oh, well, it's the windup. Let's move him to simplifying those mechanics and just get him into the stretch. It doesn't feel like it's a stretch or windup thing with Michael Kopech. It doesn't feel like it's a starter or bullpen thing. It feels like it's a Michael Kopech thing. Like it, plain and simple. It, Michael Kopech needs to figure out what's wrong with him and how he can throw that fastball for a strike. Hopefully, Brian Bannister can help him along the way. Maybe it is truly biomechanical, and hopefully, they have invested in the technology to help Kopech with that. But at this point, he is what he is, and he's going to be a wild, sometimes ineffective relief pitcher. And if they want to use him in high leverage, like the eighth inning. That's fine, but hopefully they don't have a lead to protect because that's not a guy that I want on the mound no. with a lead. No. I don't. I, and, well, I and a one-run deficit is is the, basically the same thing. I, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and I didn't like the move. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I understand like you want it. You don't. Yeah. You don't want to demote the guy and then not give him a big moment to come into. Thank you. But if he comes into that moment and does what he does yesterday, I don't have more faith in him. I lost faith in Michael Kopech after yesterday. Did you? Yes, I'm I, the Kopech guy. You are. And the whole point is that the guy can't throw strikes. Did yesterday show that he could throw strikes? That he could no. be confident on the mound? He needed a mound visit. No one else needed a mound visit yesterday, and I'm not trying to bash like the mound visit, but like it seems like Kopech is different from Crochet, Davey Garcia, and even Dominic Leon. And that's the thing. Like, If we see it and the pitching coach sees it, don't you think the opponent knows that Michael yes. Kopech is already struggling with his confidence and his stuff each time out? You saw the numbers. You br- brought up the numbers. When he's out there doing Michael Kopech, 
No one can touch him. The Yankees told you with their bats that one day that they can't touch him, and they were not very confident in what they can do versus him. I don't know what you need to do to unlock him, but somebody will eventually. I don't know if it's going to be the White Sox. And I don't know if it's just more time. I don't know if he just needs to be, you know, in his 30s and just play more baseball, and one day he'll just click and find it. I'm not sure. Let's take a break. We'll let you know about uh, our final uh, great sponsors. Also, today's takeaway is that, hey, maybe Michael Kopech just needs a little bit more work, and that's presented by Factor. Use code chgosox 5 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life with any active subscription at factormeals.com slash chgosox 5 Vinny. Sean. Would let me know about some Wisconsin innovation, oh. especially that you're drinking. Wisconsin innovation has brought us such great inventions as the cheese curd and the indoor water park, of course. But nothing is more worthy of celebration that came from the Badger State than Line and Kugel's beer, which is just sensational in all its various varieties. Uh, of course, me and Herb are enjoying the sunset wheat right now. You've got uh, the berry vice in front of us. There's the honey vice, which is made with real Wisconsin honey, of course, as as. Herb's laughing at me saying vice instead of Weiss. But uh, nothing is perhaps more enjoyable in the middle of baseball season than a summer shandy. We know that it's shandy season already. You can see the stacks of summer shandy out at the Jewel ready for you to pick up to bring to a lakeside picnic or a guaranteed rate field tailgate or even to take all the way up to Wisconsin and paddle around a lake. So here's what I'll tell you. Flavor Life Simple Moments with Lining Kugels, the official craft beer of the Chicago White Sox. Go ahead and go to liney.com slash chgo to find delivery options near you. That's l-e-i-n-i-e dot com slash chgo. Or pick up Lining Kugels pretty much anywhere they sell beer. Lining Kugels, Flavor of the Moment. Celebrate responsibly the Jacob Lining Kugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls. Yes. yes. You missed it yesterday, Vinny. Um, Sean ate one of those ice cubes yesterday. He ate it. He ate, put one of those ice cubes he in his mouth. He put it in his mouth. I swished it around and then chucked it out. Okay, Why are we so he, this? he put it in his mouth. He because didn't swallow it. No, no. It could, it's Herb plastic. Was, well, Herb was <laughs> trying to act like it was real. Mm. And I, I guess for some reason I had to prove that it wasn't. Wow. Did and you, I, did you, you know, disinfect beforehand? I threw it out. No, I meant what you put in your mouth. <laughs> oh. Built his immune system. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Whatever is on that will be killed by my stomach. The air we breathe in the city is probably worse. Exactly, sir. Do you know that we have three takeovers this year, CHGO White Sox? Three of them. May 27th versus KPW, who is in the chats right now. Memorial Day, KPW's Toronto Blue Jays will be coming to town. It's a Monday. We also have one on June 24th with Freddie Freeman and Shoei Itani coming to town with Mookie Betts. And on August 9th versus the Cubs and Cody Bellinger. You, who are out there listening and watching, can be... With us on section 147, which is down the third baseline, if you go to allchgo.com and join us, and you can just sign up for all three, right? There's a, If you sign up and look at the May 27th one, you can buy all three and join us for every single one for one low price. So go to allchgo.com and join us for one of the takeovers or all three of the takeovers, and we're going to have a great time because we did have a great time last year, even yes. though the White Sox lost to the Cubs and the Cubs. And then they lost the year before to the Toronto Blue Jays. We had good times, no matter the result. And the White Sox are just a bad team. And look who they're playing, the Blue Jays and, and Cubs. So revenge. there we go. We got to get revenge. Yeah, they're all good teams. You're going to see some great superstars and also Luis Robert. Um, the seats will be one down 147, and diehard members get 20% off all these events. You get 20% off of hats. You get 20% off of new shirts, any of those things. So if you want to become a diehard, allchgo.com slash diehard. Also... You can get a new T-shirt, Defend the South Side, or also the Sunday Fun Day shirts. There are new releases, so go to allchgo.com or CHGO Locker right now and get yourself a new shirt or a Chicago Connection shirt, which just came out like two weeks ago. Thank you, Herb. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be getting those hoodies that I ordered. Uh, that that uh, Metro car. Uh, one oh, yeah. Real, I guess it's not Metro. It's a CTA. CTA. It's yeah, whatever. Um, wow. it, That's it, some real, real suburban stuff. talk right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, the yeah, it is the way to really the fly. Rock Island. <laughs> my bad. All right. We have to get out of here in seven minutes. Uh, who are the Bulls playing? Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's, they're not the must, New Jersey Nets anymore. <laughs> Kerry Kittles doesn't play for them anymore. They don't. They don't play at the Brendan Byrne Arena anymore. No, Jarrett Jack. 
Oh. Oh. All right. Uh, let's go to at least some of these mailbag questions. We don't have to go to all of them because I don't think we will. Also, uh, James, maybe one. We might get one in. James, yeah. James Vegan reporting uh, that uh, 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 Yoki Cespedes no longer with the White Sox. That he's ah. been released from the organization. Uh, let's go to this one uh, from Octo Bear. I don't know if that's a bear that With is an legs. octopus or a play on October, but I'm surrounded by Cubs fans. Why, since birth, did I decide to be a Sox fan and stick with it for life? I think, you know, depending on how old, old you are, that was kind of the thing. If you chose a team, you were with them for life. I like kind of how the younger generations than mine, the millennials and the Gen Zs and the Gen As, are kind of like, I'm choosing a player. I'm choosing a person. And if I don't, that person doesn't, you know, do what I want them to, or that team doesn't do what I want them to, I'm going to another team. They don't have the fear of being a, and labeled a fair weather fan or a bandwagon fan. It does feel like a question that should be asked uh, on a therapist's couch rather than to three guys <laughs> with a microphone. Uh, let's go to Sam's question. Uh, he asked, what is the most optimistic outlook for the season moving forward? Garrett Crochet does that more mm -hmm. times than not. I mean, honestly, I, I know you're looking for a team record thing and listen, Maybe they do some, maybe they surprise everybody and win more games than we thought. But in terms of what is the best for this organization, it's the long term stuff showing up quicker than, than, than imagined. And Garrett Crochet, maybe by the end of this year, is a building block that you build your rotation around. Maybe Colson Montgomery comes up and, 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 and shows you some real promising things. Um, so the, the, the best case scenario for the season is that they make progress toward their goal of having another contending team. Garrett Crochet showed you in just one game of 162 what that progress could look like. I agree. Yeah, just finding as many building blocks as possible. Seems like they got one in Robert. Maybe Crochet will be one. Hey, maybe Nick Nostrini will be one later on down the road. Uh, let's go to the next one from Paul Z, who gave the show some love. We appreciate it. Paul also said, when is the trip to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin? Any, yes. any, any time that you want. Right. I'll be happily attending. Can we do the show in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin? <laughs> it's only a five-hour drive, and five hours is not too far to drive. I've driven farther. Just got to get expensed. Uh, uh, there was another question on that there, Sarah. I'm sorry. Uh, from Paul. Uh, Just the last one. My bad. Uh, what are the ways we can assess the progress of the rebuild? He was asking more stats-wise, maybe team-wise. I think the biggest thing is just they talked about pitching and defense. If you see their outs above average go up, that would be great. They were at negative 17 last year as a team for outs above average. If they are anywhere near zero or a positive number, I think that's great. And if they have a team ERA that's lower from next year, great. And I'll say this too. Remember the other focus this offseason, you know, the culture stuff, the clubhouse stuff. If you see the White Sox lose as many games as a lot of people watching this and a lot of people around uh, baseball think they're going to lose, but they don't fall into the same culture traps that they did last year, that is progress. And and to, to be able to have that foundation that isn't going to let the results of a season destroy everything, that is an important sign of progress if they do make it i hope they don't look at the record because as i always say process of results if you're seeing actual good fundamental baseball yesterday for the most part i saw better baseball on the defensive side the at bats were poor to me so i need that to improve and i know ian robo is thinking the same thing uh i did look at where the balls they put in play were like thrown and a lot of them were middle in so it did seem like they did a decent job of swinging at pitches that they they wanted to the balls that they did put in play most of them were in the zone this is just against scooble so hey i mean i'll i'll take that if we're looking for any you know light uh silver linings uh one more from we got two more uh one from ian uh have we already seen the banister effect no i mean maybe you think he'd be working with garrett crochet I mean, it's only been it? nine innings huh it's only been nine innings right well i mean Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I think what I think you've seen it in what this pitching staff currently looks like. Yeah. I mean, they tore apart this entire pitching staff. There's one guy on the team from opening day last year. That's Michael Kopech, who's not right. who's not a starter, but in the bullpen. The Brian Bannister effect has definitely already been seen in the terms of look at the offseason they just have. This pitching staff is entirely different than it was a year ago. I think it, it, at least result-wise, I don't think we can just look at one game against the Tigers uh, and and see that result as Bannister taking over. But you're right. I mean, what? I think that uh, Crochet, uh, Kopech, my guy Davey, and uh, Brian Shaw and Tanner Banks. Those but are the only guys the that were. But that's the end of last season. 
Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. For sure. That just even yeah. were on the team last right. year. Uh, right. I mean, at Leisure it didn't even make it to the Major League Baseball last year. He was in the organization, but still didn't even make it up to the majors. Uh, all right. Uh, one more from AJ, our guy. Also, uh, Ian asked about the hitting when the hitting could be fixed. I don't know. Never. <laughs> I thought they might try to fix that this year, but it didn't seem so. Uh, final one from AJ. Uh, what is your favorite restaurant in the city? What is your usual go to spot? Go ahead, Herb. My go-to spot is a place called Kigolani in Uptown. It's a Mexican restaurant that does Oaxacan style. Delicious. And my favorite probably is, I'll go with uh, Chicago Cut. Uh, favorite restaurant, uh, I love going to Union in Logan Square. It is attached to the Metal Lark, which I think is the best cocktail bar in the city. So you do those at the same time, and that's great. My go-to, Bien Misabe on Montrose oh. in Ravenswood. Venezuelan food. The arepas are fantastic. Everything is fantastic. And uh, I'm moving next month, and I'm going to be moving even closer to Bien Misabe than I am currently. Nice. So it per- perhaps expect the waistline to grow over the course of the season. Muy bien. Wow. C. C. too. There you go. Uh, he, uh, AJ threw out uh, some, uh, what was it, bougie picks. He said uh, that he loves uh, Bites Asian Kitchen on Clark and end up Very good. at the Bar on Buena or Jake's Pub uh, in uh, Uptown almost Ugh. once a week. And Not if, a ch- Jake's Pub on the rough at all. Oh, okay. It's a greasy spoon. Uh, <laughs> and if they're talking if uh, fancy slash expensive, got to go with Trivoli Tavern or Ricardo Chattoria. Uh one Mama place mia. The, that I liked, I'm not, you know, obviously I'm, I'm still new to the north side, so I'm still getting, like, my favorite spots up here. My true go-to on the south side, just pizza. Go get Milano's. It's very, 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 very good, whether you're getting deep dish or thin. Uh, the one place that I really like that's kind of a little bit more affordable, less bougie, is uh, Duck Inn. Uh, Love the Duck Inn. Really good. Love the Duck Inn. Go get the Duck Inn hot dog, and that's just a really lovely, beautiful spot. Oh, the patio's fantastic. Right. You got to order the Duck the, a day before. The rotisserie if you duck. want the rotisserie yeah, yeah. duck, you have to call them the day before your reservation <laughs> and order it. It's so good. It's very worth yeah. it. Uh, and then uh, if we're going bougie, there's a place uh, around here-ish, uh, Heritage, Chicago. Uh, a very good spot that I've gone to, like, I think six times or so. Uh, very, very good. So uh, th- those are my spots. Uh, you got anything, Sarah? You're a Chicagoan. <laughs> I would say my, my go-to favorite restaurant is a place in Lincoln Park, Old Pueblo, and it's a Mexican place. Really, really good. Really good margaritas. Um, And then honestly, any place in West Loop is really, really good by Fulton Market. All those places are good. Muy bien. Uh, So that's going to do it for all of our uh, suggestions. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribing. We got the Bulls pregame as they take on the Nets coming up right away. We got to get off the show anyways. Uh, Thank you to Sarah for producing. Thank you to Vinny, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. That's Herb Lawrence. I'm Sean Anderson. Follow us at CHGO underscore White Sox. Goodbye. We all city like the mayor. 